So Christine, you were at one of Fortune's other recent conferences, and you said something that I found very surprising and interesting, that JP Morgan, when it started looking at blockchain and what it could be used for, you looked at payments and found that blockchain technology was not actually as good as you thought for payments. So I guess my question is, what have you found it more useful for? How can it actually help JP Morgan? Yeah, sure. Uh, we at JP Morgan are spending a lot of time uh, investing in blockchain, uh, thinking specifically about how blockchain can be used uh, for security. So, for example, like debt issuances. This past April, as an example, uh, we tested out with National Bank of Canada uh, asset managers like Goldman Sachs Asset Management, uh, Wamco, and uh, Pfizer Treasury. Uh, basically, a debt instrument, like I'd lend to you money like over some time, uh, like an end-to-end -end -end built entirely on blockchain and automated by smart contracts. And what we got from that was basically a self-service uh, financial instrument where literally all the issuer had to do was, you know, configure like the size and the tenor and, and uh, you know, whether or not it was fixed or floating rate. Uh, the asset managers just has had, had to say like, okay, these are the, this is the allocation that I wanted to uh, purchase of, of that debt instrument. And then from there, it was a set, in it, set it and forget it instrument that, you know, basically paid interest on time and like will pay down on time in a year or so. And so that was like a really interesting test where in today's world, in the financial markets, that financial instrument requires like number of operational, uh, operational teams to support, not only from the issuer side, from the bank side, from each of the asset managers, and then like a whole other business around like just making sure that that financial, financial instrument is being paid down correctly. So uh, it was a really powerful test. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can re-instrument our existing uh, financial products on blockchain to uh, increase like automation and to basically uh, enable cost savings for the whole ecosystem, not just for us as a bank. Yeah, now the CEO of JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, has famously called Bitcoin a fraud. But does Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency have a role in any of the experiments and projects that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, I think that the public blockchain space, and Kathleen can talk a lot about this uh, in this segment, is really exciting. I mean, basically, this is like the, gr th these are the grounds where all of the cutting edge in innovation is happening because it's unbounded enthusiasm and literally people just like who are, you know, at either studying like the academic concepts or, you know, like uh, experts in the technology and engineering to just go ahead and build in, without any sort of uh, constraints or limitations. Um, unlike I'll set like a big bank. Uh, and so we look a lot at what is happening in the public space as inspiration um, and just take like little pieces of you know what what is being done and what's relevant into into the house into like our large bank to um, basically enhance the work that we're doing and or sometimes we we partner with some of the companies that are out there hmm. to accelerate our progress. Yeah, and Kathleen, you founded Tezos, which is a blockchain protocol kind of, you know, akin to Bitcoin or Ethereum. But I guess, you know, how, how is it different? And what, what can it do that those blockchains can't? Is this something that businesses could use? Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, my project Tezos is basically um, a riff on Bitcoin in some ways. So Bitcoin is this um, cryptocurrency. It's meant to be used by anyone in the world. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, blockchains are a piece of coordination technology. And yet the profound irony is that Bitcoin, its first implementation, um, lacks a mechanism to upgrade itself. So it can't come to consensus on um, new pieces of technology that they want to include into the protocol. So Tezos addresses this by having a native um, governance mechanism, uh, which facilitates upgrades to the protocol rather seamlessly um, through a, a vote in the first iteration by token holders. Um, so, I mean, to that end, we also have smart contracts, which are basically a way to have an automated escrow between two potentially mistrusting parties. Um, it adds another layer of complexity to um, transactions that you make with someone across the world that you might not know. Um, so we also have smart contracts as a part of this. And um, we really dug deep into the academic um, uh, applied cryptography and also formal methods and programming language theory um, to make assurances about the behavior of the code. So when you're, you know, transacting with someone who you don't know, um, you want some, some proofs or some behavior uh, of the code to be guaranteed against certain objectives. And so with Tezos, we, we really um, had that as an emphasis in our smart contract design. Um, so yeah, by all means, like if JP Morgan wants to use Tezos technology, I'm all on board with that. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think it's really interesting you said uh, escrow, like a smart contract to do an escrow function, because for those of you that you know, kind of work with banks on a normal day basis, you know that typically banks 
are what have escrow accounts, right? And I so mean, repo, like yeah. Nice. And so like now, what we're saying is essentially a technology uh, that automates the function of escrow that a bank would typically have to do, right? And and this is the reason why like researching this technology is really important for a bank like JP Morgan and other banks that are involved in the space is because really what we're talking about is a technology that can potentially transform the way uh, we do business, like transform the way that we add value to clients. Like if, if escrow services is a thing that we offer to clients and this is something that we can automate in smart contracts, you know, like that means we have to evolve and change, change like what is the offering that we have to clients, like if that's something that's easily automatable. And, and, so and would JP Morgan look at using Tezos potentially? Uh, yeah, we should definitely explore it. I mean, we're definitely exploring all the different protocols. Uh, <laughs> Can I get that know. in writing? We <laughs> uh, <laughs> got it on stage. So. Yeah, it's true. It's recorded. Yeah, it's um, all on the record, like on yeah. stage. So. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and to that end, like I would add, I'm on the other side of the spectrum. So you know, Christine does a great job of of making the bank more efficient. I'm more on the you know crazy fringes of the wild west. And uh, for for me, I see like the real value. Like if Tez, you know, Tezos, it can be a lot of things. But um, the measure I would have of success is like if it makes it easier for people to have access to the sort of financial instruments that aren't available to them because they don't have a bank account. Um, and so I, I think we're trying to hit like different segments of the market, but our goals are probably very similar in what we want to engineer, which is better money. Yeah, I'm going to come to the audience for questions in a minute, so get your questions ready. But Kathleen, you know, I wanted to talk about. So you raised your initial coin offering or ICO last year, raised 232 million dollars. The market value of Tezzies, which are your Tezos cryptocurrency, are now 252 million dollars. So still, you know, substantial amount of money. Now the cryptocurrency market, Tezos and everything like that has down about 80% this year. Yeah. How does it does it matter? I mean, do you need this stuff to be valuable in order to keep building? Yeah, I mean, so I've been really following the space for about 7 years now. Um, so I've seen a lot of ups and downs and like I have a lot of conviction in the technology's long-term promise. I think price is by and large a distraction if you're someone who's really building for the long term. Um, you have to have a lot of conviction in what you do. Um, so I, I never check prices and things like that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's kind of a distraction for people, for, for smaller minds. Um. Yeah, and when you're, when you're not getting compensated with the, with the crypto upside, then uh, definitely it's about conviction <laughs> in the technology. Oh when yeah, totally. On, when you're on bank salary. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think what's really important to note is that, uh, you know, we're talking about, like, potentially uh, the next generation of financial infrastructure. Like, people yeah. think of the internet that we know of as the internet of information, like us blockchain nerds think of blockchain as like the internet of value. Like how do you democratize like the creation and the exchange of value just as the internet as we know it uh, democratize the access and the creation of the information. And you know, if you think about it, the internet of uh, information that we know of is like now more than six decades old. Um, and you know, we had someone from Amazon here speaking like, you know that Amazon is actually a 27 year old company by now, but we actually know that, remember a time, I, most of you guys I think, remember a time when there was no Amazon or when Amazon was a bookstore, right? So like, pro like te technological progress takes time and I think that to look at you know, a daily price on, on crypto is like a little bit, it's kind of like a red herring. Like in reality, like, the value is in what the technology uh, rails can provide over time, and it might be a multi-decade thing. Like, might oh, never uh, get any crypto I outside. Would, but let's that's, pause I'm, there for a second fine. to see if I can take a question. Was there a question from the audience, or one somebody somebody here? Thanks. Yeah, please tell us who you are. Sure. Hi, I'm Elise Nelson, um, CEO and co-founder of Vital Voices. We work with women leaders around the world, and. Um, I wanted so much to understand blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, <laughs> that I took a course at Oxford, and I have no time, but I decided I'm gonna take this course, online course to really understand it. I'm, I came to the end of it, I passed somehow, but honestly, I still am, I'm still not sure I completely understand. And I think what I, what I really wanna know from, from all of you, because the reason I, I took that course is I read so many case studies, about how it supports social development. And I found so many people in the course being such activists. And what I've certainly heard is that um, this new wave, as you've just talked about, could really op you know, offer an opportunity to so many of the women entrepreneurs and activists that I work with around the world. But I'd love your advice about you know, how do we make that happen? Because I don't, I don't see that happening right now. I mean, I, I see a lot of men rushing in. I'm not seeing the women. So I'd love, I'd love to get your thoughts. 
How do we get more women in blockchain? Um, good question. And congratulations on passing the course. <laughs> um, that's no small feat. Um, I think that um, there's a few things that are inhibiting um, blockchain technology from being more accessible to everyone um, of, of every gender. Um, I think primarily it's a user experience. I think in the ideal world, you don't have to know exactly what this technology is, or you don't even have to know like anything about consensus or any of the you know applied cryptography things. Um, you should just know that it's a reliable way to transmit value across the internet. The same way that when I open up my email, I don't think like, boy, I sure hope TCP IP works. Like, um, you take it for granted because it works, right? So um, I mean, that's my objective. Uh, like I, I hope that I don't have to explain like esoteric concepts and applied cryptography and distributed networking to everyone I try to entice to, to learn about Tezos. Um, so I mean, I think it's a user experience and whatnot. I also think that like the cooler applications that happen are going to happen after um, just the become after blockchains and cryptocurrencies become better money, meaning you know privacy, fungibility, all those things, um, throughput, um, all increase. So the onus is on me to really uh, make it more accessible. <laughs> um, so I don't have a good answer, but I certainly have a path. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, like I see uh, the blockchain revolution. I mean, let's just call it evolution because it's not. Uh, it will take some time. Um, I see it as almost like an evening of like the playing ground because it's new to everyone, as Kathleen said, right? Like so, you know, even like the languages that you'd write smart contracts in are not the languages that people have historically like studied. That's like new language, like Solidity for Ethereum, as an example. Um, and so, I think that it's a great opportunity where if you're entrepreneuring and you want to learn something new and you want to get into a new space, it is like a great opportunity to kind of step in and not feel like you need to catch up like a decade or two that like all these people are like, you know, that have been institutionalized as like, you know, kind of having like a better, a better foot in this area. And I think the same goes for investing. Uh, actually, no one really knows what's, what's going on at the market anyway. So like, you know, like in terms of like being an investor in, in crypto as an example, like, you know, certainly like there's not some, you, you don't have to compete with people who have said like, I've been investing in this for like X decades and I know how this market works. Like no one knows yeah. how this, this market is working Do right now. Do you own now. cryptocurrency? Uh, no, not not to own <laughs> currency. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that it's a great opportunity. But I think that you know, I, I think the onus is on us to step up, right? So you know, obviously our team has been hiring as we've been spending more time, um, you know, with this technology and not a lot of female candidates, uh, to be fair. Uh, you know, and I, and I understand like there aren't a lot of women in, in Wall Street on Wall Street. Uh, and there aren't a lot of women in technology. So when you put the Venn diagram together and you're talking about like Wall Street and technology, like literally like such a small set of people. Uh, and then like, then there's the whole factor of like, I, you know, mo I think a lot of us do this and or at least I do like, it's, it's like, oh, well, if I don't know this like front to back and like everything and, you know, feel totally confident in it, might, I might not go for it. Right. And I think that that holds you back. Right. Like, I think there are people that just go for it and they actually have no idea and they get the opportunity and, you know, you like others like may not be may not be getting that opportunity. So, you know, as a hiring manager, like I've actively like tried to well pay it forward because, you know, I had a, an amazing opportunity from a woman that hired me who was in my seat uh, previously. And so I try to pay forward and like really try to find uh, those gems of people who, you know, they're going to show up and say, like, I don't have blockchain experience. Uh, I may not even have technology experience, but I really want to learn and I'm really into this. I'm in it for the long haul and I care about solving problems. And like that in itself might be enough uh, in most cases. Have either of you hired women? Yeah. 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 I, but it, it's hard. Like, I mean, I, I actively had to like go send like a job post through like, you know, a women's network at JP Morgan. And then, you know, through that, I ended up finding someone and didn't exactly fit the profile like she was like sales but in she didn't have a lot of blockchain experience but she tried to toy around with it on the side and and she's perfect like she's amazing like it's like the star story there, so cool. there aren't many women in the space but the ones that are there are really awesome so i joke that like proportionate iq were really overrepresented but <laughs> uh, <laughs> if any of you are looking for jobs in blockchain sounds like you know where to go christine yeah. kathleen thank you Thanks. so much Thanks.